So I think that you are in a very lucky situation now because I think that you have a, a very nice team here, you have a very nice infrastructure and the history of neurological diseases also offers you a very nice opportunity to take even a leading position because many things changed in the last, last 20 years and in a way we have to rewrite the concepts of neurological diseases. So everything what was published 20, 30 years ago, there are many things very important, but so many new things happened that we have to re-evaluate these concepts. And I think that if you manage to come up with a strong team, then you will be in a leading position. So in this presentation, I would like to summarize my experience. I started my career as a neurologist and I also still try to do that. And also I work as a neuropathologist. So I had the opportunity to look more than 4,000 brains with these modern methods. Uh, so first I would like to uh, define neurodegenerative diseases, how the concepts changed. I would like to talk about the new concepts, very briefly about the different diseases. And then I would talk to you that the things are not easy, they are not black and white, not so simple. So the complexity and uh, I would like to show you how we work in a brain bank uh, situation. So 100 years ago, the colleague said that neurodegenerative disease means that the neurons are lost. They die and this is why they don't function well and depending on which anatomical region is affected, the patients have symptoms. In the last 20 years, this concept has, been, has changed and there is a new sentence, a new wording also, that in addition to this neuronal loss, there are deposition of proteins in the brain. And these proteins can be outside the cell or in the cell. And researchers detected that they are not always in the neurons, but they can be also in the supportive tissue which support the neurons. This is my approach to a patient or to a clinical phenotype. So we see the patient in the clinic, but the many things happen in the brain of the patient showing the same symptoms to you. I'm talking about vulnerability patterns, which for me means that there is an anatomical level of vulnerability, which functional systems are affected. Then there is a cellular level, which neuronal groups, or if other cell types are affected. And we are also talking about the protein vulnerability level, which means that the proteins have biochemical changes. And this can further help us to classify the diseases. And in the background, you have a genetic background, which is not, also, not only disease-causing mutations, but the genes which modify the disease or susceptibility. So this is the four steps that you, to reach a final diagnosis or a classification of a disease. So first you meet the patient and I, mostly the neurodegenerative diseases present with dementia or with movement disorder. Dementia means that the cognitive functions are altered. And these are the four main types. And already based on these four main types, you can already think about which anatomical regions are affected. And this is very important because you have the possibility for neuroimaging, for MRI, and with this you can already see which is the first affected region. The patients then usually show a lot of complex symptoms. You, we, you have to return back to the first symptoms because that will help you to orientate which anatomical region was the first affected. These are the movement disorders, which you are, as a neurologist you are uh, aware of. So there are different types of movement disorders patients who cannot move well or very slow or who have plus movements or, or uh, they are not stably moved or the muscles are not innervated well. For the anatomical background for movement disorders, we have to talk about other anatomical regions, so different than in cognitive decline, so the basal ganglia, the thalamus, subthalamus, the cerebellum, the brainstem and the spinal cord. 
To understand the concept of neurodegenerative diseases, you have to understand also the concept of so-called cortico subcortico cortical circuits. This means that there are circuits between the cortex, the basal ganglia, the thalamus, and going back to the cortex. If you see a patient and you think that the patient has a neurodegenerative disease, but you don't find anything in the MRI, you don't find any biomarker, maybe there is only a five millimeter small vascular lesion in the white matter in a strategic region or in the thalamus in a strategic nucleus, and it will produce the similar symptoms as you think it's a neurodegenerative disease. So this is why these cortico subcortico cortical circuits are very important to learn. So now, until now, I talk about the clinical level. And what is in the background? In the background, you see these proteins. So these proteins now are thought to be that we can use them as a markers for disease. So the aim would be that in a living patient, you try to classify, and I will show you now in a post-mortem level how to classify, but the aim would be to translate it to an in vivo level. And in the first level, this is enough for, or would be important to talk about prognosis to the patients, or for you, or for the family, to understand why some patients rapidly progress in four or five years, they are very severe, or why some patients live for 15, 20 years with the same symptoms. So in the first level, to understand these biomarkers is to understand the prognosis. In the second level, the aim will be to develop disease-specific uh, therapies, and therefore you will also need this. These are the six proteins which are now, you see, in the brains of more than 98% of the sporadic adult onset neurodegenerative diseases. Four of them in the cells and two of them outside the cells. But there are further proteins, I will not go into details, these are rare hereditary disorders. The next level is the which cell is affected. So these proteins then make aggregates and depositions mostly in neurons, but many don't know that they also make protein aggregates in the supportive cells, so the astroglia and the oligodendroglial cells. And most of these we do not use even for the neuropathological classification because it's so recent, so new development that we have to understand this. For example, if you talk about Parkinson's disease, everybody talks about Levy bodies. You have heard about this, I will show you. But actually, these proteins are also in the astrocytes in Parkinson's disease and we do not know what is the message for that. So you have these opportunities to make new observations to translate it to the clinical and the biomarker level. So this is a complex image. I just want to show you that you, we already have the opportunity to start to harmonize these different aspects, the clinical, the neuropathological, the basic biochemical observations. And this is where I think that you can also contribute with your uh, facilities here. Before I show you the diseases, I want to talk about the concept of disease spreading. So today many researchers believe that the pathogenesis of neurodegenerative diseases show prion-like mechanisms. What does this mean? This means that the prions are going, prions are infectious proteins which can go from cell to cell. They are like a virus, but they don't have all features of a virus. They have only proteins. They don't have nucleic acid, as far as we know. So in all of the disorders, I would like to mention if there is any evidence for cell to cell propagation or the so-called hierarchical involvement of brain regions. This means that it starts somewhere and then it will affect the next region which is connected to this and the next and the next. So it goes through the brain. This is why the patient starts with a symptom, then comes the next one, always some progression. This also raises the issue whether some of these disorders can be transmissible between humans, which means that if you make a neurosurgical operation in a patient, can you take this bad, bad protein to another patient? or not. This is a big debate now. What is the prion hypothesis? I usually take a paper to the students. 
So the, this is a, a prion, this is the prion model. So this is a normal protein, which is an alpha helix, and the bad proteins are beta sheet structure. So it's only the change in the three-dimensional structure. It's not, not a change in the amino acid structure. So you, for example, you have a paper. This cannot fly. I just change the three-dimensional structure, and then I can throw it to Pascal. So it flies. I did not put iron in it. I just changed the three-dimensional structure. So it's the same for the proteins. They just change the three-dimensional structure. And this is why it's difficult to, to make antibodies which make a difference between the normal and the not normal because you just have a three-dimensional difference and it's very difficult to find these biochemical aspects. And now very briefly I will talk about the, the neuropathological features of major disease entities. In the first level I think that I will mention a lot of diseases, but the aim here is not to make you bored or make think that it's very, it's too much. It's just to show you that there's a lot of diseases, a lot of different diseases when you look in the microscope. We just have to harmonize and come back to the patients and make a personalized diagnosis. So you, you hear about the therapy trials in Alzheimer's disease and then they put every patient with Alzheimer's disease in a therapy trial and they don't have success. So I would like to show you that there is a lot of different disorders so if you try to develop clusters of patients and put them into therapy trials probably you will have more success. This is where I also see your uh, pioneer possibilities if you start with, the, with the, this kind of uh, work here. So for all diseases, I will use this uh, anatomy, protein, clinical spectrum strategy. So Alzheimer disease shows neuronal loss in anatomical regions that are important for memory and cognition. And they show two types of proteins. One is inside the cell, which we call tau, and the other one is outside the cell. It makes big plaque-like deposits, it's a bit amyloid. You have neuroimaging possibility to detect the extracellular deposits, PET, and there are already neuroimaging possibilities to detect the tau in the brain. It is not yet in the diagnostic practice. The beta amyloid detection is already in the diagnostic practice, and as far as I know, it's also here. And the tau is coming soon to the diagnostic practice. Uh, so for the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease on a microscopic level, we have to evaluate both of these. And I mentioned to you about the hierarchical distribution. So tau also shows this hierarchical distribution, and there are six stages of this tau pathology in the brain. So it starts in the entorinal cortex and the hippocampus. This is important for the memory. And then it goes to the limbic cortex, which is important for emotions and behavior and personality. And then it reaches the high complex uh, cortical areas. Actually, in a normal aging, so if you look at individuals who are 85, 90 years old, without any clinical symptoms, they already have stage one or stage two pathology. It's very rare above 90 that you don't see this. So it's a kind of a normal aging also. And then there is a border that from this point, the patient has symptoms. And it is very difficult to define this border. It's something between this three and four stage. And it's an, also an individual differences who can live even with a four stage without dramatic symptoms and who shows already with two. And this is what I will return back in the back in the end of my talk. The beta amyloid also shows a kind of progression. But very interestingly for me, it goes in the op opposite direction as tau. And they are not going always together. This is a, always a conflict because they think that beta amyloid generates the tau pathology. But this is very difficult to see in the brain. Because actually it starts in the temporal and occipital cortex and tau reaches the occipital cortex in the end stage of the disease, in the last terminal phase of an Alzheimer's disease. 
although beta amyloid starts there. And uh, then it goes to the hippocampus, then to the basal ganglia, to the brainstem and cerebellum. And this you can monitor with the PET imaging. So you can think about this. Again, if there is an individual above 80 years, it can, it, the person can have beta amyloid in the PET imaging without clinical symptoms. You don't have to diagnose at once Alzheimer's disease if you see beta amyloid in the PET imaging. For me, if I see in the PET imaging beta amyloid, this means that something is going on which is compatible with the pathogenesis, markers of Alzheimer's disease, but you need the clinical and the neuropsychological symptoms and so on. I would like to show you some images. Here, everything what is brown is not normal. This is beta amyloid deposition in the brain. I would like to show you that already if you look the form of these, the, we say morphology, is different in different anatomical regions. This is the memory center. This is close to the memory center. You see that the, how it looks like is different. This is the hippocampus. This is the basal ganglia. So with this, I want to show you that, for example, the PET imaging does not detect all of these deposits. It detects only a, a subset of these deposits. So be aware of this. So until now, I talk about Alzheimer's disease. And now I will talk to you about the next type of cognitive disorder, which is called frontotemporal dementia. This is also a frequent disorder, but is less unknown, or only in the last 15 years it became to be known. These patients usually went to the psychiatry unit 20 years ago. They thought that they have a kind of psychosis or depression or any kind of psychiatric disease. And now the concepts change and it, it seems that below the age of 65, actually it is the second most frequent dementia form. And it is very important because it affects the people who are in an active uh, uh, phase of their life or social activity and working and so on. So it can start even when somebody is 50 or below. And the frontal and the temporal lobes are affected. And these are the regions which make us humans. So it's not only the memory, but it is the behavior and how our personality is there. So this is what changes in these disorders and then later on progresses to further dementia symptoms. So if we talk about frontotemporal dementia, we talk about three major proteins. If I would have this presentation 10 years ago, I would not talk about FUS and I would not talk about TDP43. 20 years ago, there was two publications with TDP43 linked to HIV infection. Nobody cited, nobody looked at it. Now there's 3,000 and it seems to be one of the most important proteins. It is a tar DNA binding protein. FUS is well known in oncology, fused in sarcoma. Nobody talked about that, only the last five years. So with this, I also want to show you that there is place for you to find new things. Uh, and some, um, now I will show you, really like a postcard, I will show you some images, just that you once hear the spectrum of diseases. So it's a lot of diseases which go on and we need to find the harmony and rewrite this history. So for diseases which, where you see tau protein, we call tau patties. These are Pick's disease, progressive supranuclear palsy, corticobasal degeneration, cases with mutation and so on. These are the clinical presentations. So the patients with tau protein they have frontotemporal dementia, but they can go to the movement disorder clinic also. And there are rare syndromes also, which are associated with this uh, tau pathology. And here I can talk about the next level, about the biochemical level for classification. Because the tau protein in our brain, we have six isoforms of this tau. Three of these six isoforms have a region in the tau protein which is called a repeat region and this has three repeats and three of these six isoforms has four repeats. If somebody has a disease, either the three repeat isoforms will be in the brain or the four repeat or both. 
And on a scientific level, you can detect these in the cerebrospinal fluid. So this is the next step to try to subclassify diseases. Tau protein is mostly in neurons, but recently we have found that it's also in astrocytes and oligodendrocytes. Now I'll show you these postcards. For example, peak disease is a frontotemporal dementia disorder with a very severe temporal and frontal lobe atrophy. The tau is in neurons and it is a 3R. Progressive supranuclear repulse and corticobasal degeneration is a 4R taupati and it is in neurons and in astrocytes and the patients go either to the dementia unit or to the movement disorder unit. So you have to sometimes every month or two months you need a common meeting to discuss some of the patients because the, the dementia unit and the movement clinic uh, overlaps in a lot of patients. So here I would like to mention a very interesting aspect. Because they are four R taupatis, because they are affecting the same kind of cells, a group of researchers thinks that it is not needed to distinguish these diseases because on a biochemical level they are pretty similar. But then there's another group of researchers, including myself, who think that these are important to dif distinguish. Because if you look at the ultrastructure, they are different. And the astroglial protein deposition is also very, very different. This is corticobasal degeneration. This is the nucleus of the astrocyte. And these brown dots, the pathological tau, is in the distal part of the processes. In PSP, it is close to the nucleus. We say it's the proximal part. So this has different effects on the function of the astrocytes, and it affects different astroglia populations. Why is this important? Because I talk about this prion hypothesis. The prion hypothesis also means that if you inject a prion infected brain from a Kreutzfeld Jakob diseased patient to a mouse, then depending on which patient you infect, the mouse will get different diseases, different prion diseases, different phenotypes. So we talk about strains. It, it is like uh, influenza virus. This year we have this strain, next year we have the other strain. Once it's more severe, one it's nothing. So if we talk that tau is also a kind of an agent which can spread in the brain from cell to cell, then it is very important that the ultrastructure, ultrastructure means that in electron microscopy, 100,000 magnification, they look different. So it might be that there are two agents going in different uh, way in the brain, but they have overlapping, like two influenza, they have overlapping features, but they can cause this year severe lung problems as an uh, additional <laughs> problem, or the next year the other strain doesn't cause big problems. So it might be that these disorders are just representative of different strains of this tau agent or tau uh, protein. In 2003, I was in the in a night duty in a stroke ambula or the stroke uh, in the clinic, and I saw a patient with very severe cerebrimedia infarction, and the patient died in two or three days. And the family asked for a neuropathological examination, and I was leading at that time in Hungary a brain bank, and I was thinking that it's it, in a stroke patient we don't usually don't do a big uh, brain banking. But then, because the family asked, and then I saw that um, there was an asymmetric atrophy, I made this examination. And then I talked to the family, and they said that before this stroke, the patient had behavioral change and so on. So I saw a very strange pathology in the microscope, and I knew at once that this has not been described. But I was a young Hungarian researcher, and I thought that I cannot tell this to the famous people, because they will not believe it. So I went back to the, to the archives of the institute, which was back to the 50s, and I looked at the reports of the colleagues. At that time, they did not have immunohistochemistry, so I, I looked for strange sentences in the archives, like, it looks like peak, but very strange, or something like this. And I took 30 or 40 of these cases, and then I found six 
of these cases. So I went to Indianapolis in 2007 and I showed there and we wrote with the colleagues there a paper. And this turned out to be a new entity which is called white metatauopathy with globular glial inclusions. And the new thing here is that tau is in the oligodendrocytes. Oligodendrocytes we thought are not important. They are in the myelin, around the axons, the processes of the neurons, not important. But this disease is a very severe disease and the pathology is in the white matter. So the red dots here show where I found these deposits and it's in the limbic system, so it is compatible, and frontal lobe, so it's compatible with this. So later I contacted famous researchers from the world, Mayo Clinic and many from Europe, including from Spain, and we found that this is a new entity, it is in every country. It is a frontotemporal dementia phenotype, but sometimes it is associated with motor neuron symptoms and sometimes even with Parkinsonism. And now about the hierarchical. For PIX disease, there is also a paper which shows that it is a hierarchical type. And also for these globular glial taupaties, we also see that patients who have a very pre phase of disease, like only anxiety attacks. This patient was in the psychiatric clinic for panic attacks and depression and died in the hospital for a myocardial infarction. So actually it could have been treated as a reference, a control brain, but they also wanted the autopsy. And here we found the same disease, but in an early stage. It was only in a small area of the brain. And this is an end stage who, who had a very severe dementia. So, and finally, very briefly, that there are some mutations in the tau gene which can also cause uh, severe uh, tau pathology. And uh, two further diseases with tau. One is argyrophilic grain disease. These patients go to the memory clinic. And these patients have tau in the dendrites of the process of the neurons. So the contact between the neurons are lost. And here there is also a hierarchical staging. This, there's no clinical pathological data about these cases. The very few publications from Japan show that these patients look like an Alzheimer patient, but in, within one year or be within two years, they have a very severe incontinence and psychiatric problems like aggression or, or uh, psychosis or depression. Because the disease affects the amygdala, which is very important, and also the hypothalamus, so the innervation of the urinary bladder. And finally, another tau disease, or the last for today, is a disease which looks like Alzheimer's disease. You see the tau neurofibrillary tangles, but there is no beta amyloid. So this is now called as primary age-related taupathy. And in comparison with a typical Alzheimer's disease, they do not have, or very rarely, the APOE4 allele, which is frequent in Alzheimer's disease. And they don't have amyloid plaque. So these are the patients which you, in the clinic, you diagnose in an Alzheimer patient, but the PET imaging is negative. But it looks like, and you think that this is an Alzheimer patient. And it is very similar to Alzheimer, but doesn't have beta amyloid plaque. So if you put this patient in the beta amyloid vaccination study, then you will be not so successful. <laughs> and finally, I would like to show you, when I talk about tau, the, the, a new aspect. 2004, there was a paper from Germany showing that in aged people, tau-positive astrocytes accumulate in the amygdala. In 2011, we reported in Vienna in a longitudinal aging study about 6% of the patients who had dementia above 85, a disease where the tau is only in astrocytes, and they don't have Alzheimer's disease, but clinically they look like Alzheimer's. So later we followed and classified this disorder. And then I, I met colleagues from other parts of the world, and. They also see different these type of diseases, but nobody reported or reported with completely different names. So there was a big mixture of literature. So we make a harmonized nomenclature for this. And this means that in the aging brain, you see new novel types of morphologies. I don't want to bore you with the details, but these astrocytes can be in the gray matter, but they can be also in the white matter. 
They can be in subependymal, this is where you have the cerebrospinal fruit, this is the border. This is the supial or perivascular. We are trying to understand what does this mean. And in a recent study, this is the locations where you find it. The green is the white matter, the blue is the gray matter, the red is the supial. And it seems that the age, of course, it associates with ventricular enlargement, the atherosclerosis, and male gender. And this is very interesting because this type of astrocytic tau pathology is seen in young, in young American football players or boxing people. This is called a trauma, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. So what we see in the aging people Morphology is very similar to young people who have minor but repeated head trauma. The only difference is that the American football players, in addition to the astrocytes, they develop also neuron fibrillary tangles. But this is a very interesting aspect, whether the pathogenesis, what we see in these very old people, have something common to this minor head trauma aspects. And astrocytes seem to be important. This is a recent study in brain which we show, where we show that actually corticobasal degeneration also seems to start in astrocytes. So this is a, an un, this is a white area in the cartoon or the ground. It's, it's still there's many things to develop here. So we have to change our concept that maybe it's not only the neurons are important but also the supportive cells. And very briefly I show you the further uh, proteinopathies in the next three minutes. One is this TDP43. This is a spectrum disorder, so the patients come with frontotemporal dementia or they have a pure amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, which means that atrophy of the muscles and it's a muscle problem, innervation of the muscle, or they show both. This is the, these are the morphologies, I will go fastly. And very importantly, based on the morphology, you can already suspect what is the genetic background and what will be the clinical symptom. So now the aim is to translate this really to the clinical practice and my last slide I will show you at the level we are now. The FUS proteinopathies are very rare, but maybe because we have not yet uh, detected this or not yet been able to detect this. The next protein is alpha-synuclein. This is also a frequent, this is associated with Parkinson's disease, with dementia, with Levy bodies or multiple system atrophy. The definition of Parkinson's disease is a, it's a movement disorder, it's a problem of the dopaminergic system and Levy bodies are present and we know that these are alpha-synuclein. This is how a normal substantia nigra looks like, this is this brown, this is the mesencephalon. This is a patient with Parkinson's disease and you, s you don't see this brown substantia nigra because in a normal brain you have the neuromelanin which is brown, melanin, like in the skin. And in a Parkinson patient these are lost. These are the Levy bodies. And these are alpha-synuclein immune reactive here, red. But this is very important and this is the, the major marker of uh, Parkinson disease, but in the recent uh, years there were new antibodies and one of uh, us, one of is ours, which detects uh, the very, very pathological form of alpha-synuclein. And with this we found that it's not only Levy bodies. There's a lot of further type of everything what is brown is not normal. These dots between the cells and even astrocytes again. So Parkinson's disease pathology, alpha synuclein is much more than Levy bodies, but we don't know yet what does it mean. This is really the last two or three years. So if you start to have a nice collection where you have clinical data, biomarkers, and then maybe possibility for brain donation or post-mortem examination, you can be a, really come up with very novel uh, observations. In Parkinson's disease, there is also the, the hierarchical spreading. So disease starts in the medulla oblongata and then in the pons and then in the substantia nigra, then in the amygdala and cortex. This means that when the patient goes to the neurologist, the patient is already in the third stage of disease. 
The disease started 10 years before the patient goes to the neurologist and the patient already had complaints. Maybe had complaints with obstipation or sleep problems or depression. But if somebody with 65 or 70 goes to the family doctor with these complaints, they say, okay, I don't know what this is, it's unspecific, it's, nobody will think about Parkinson's disease. So it's very difficult to say something at this stage. But actually, Parkinson's disease pathology is not only in the brain, it's also in the extra brain areas, like in the gastrointestinal tract. So many people think that it starts in the gastrointestinal tract and goes in a nerve, in the vagus, to the medulla oblongata, like a virus. Why are the brain donation and the studies are important? Because there's a lot of genes associated with Parkinsonism, but we don't have enough data which one really is a model for sporadic Parkinson disease. Because there's only a few data which genes associate with the same pathology as a sporadic. So there's a lot of genes where we do not know what, what is the pathogenesis related to sporadic disease. Multiple system atrophy. Yes, I will speed up. This is a disease with uh, Parkinsonism, and it shows also oligodendroglial inclusions. And here also a hierarchical type of spreading is, is noted. Now I will talk about the concomitant pathologies. Concomitant means that there is not only one type of pathology, but different type of pathologies in the brain. Ten years ago, this meant uh, Alzheimer's disease with vascular lesions, so infarction or bleeding. Then they recognize that these patients also have levy bodies. And now we talk about patients who have a lot of different proteinopathies. This is a study, an aging study in Vienna, where we saw that many patients have even five or six pathologies. So actually, you can imagine and expect all kinds of combinations. So even a PSP, taupati, can combine with multiple system atrophy pathology. So you need to, this is why it's important to check, even if you think it's a PSP, it might be two diseases, two different disorders. So this is the concept of concomitant pathologies. This means that we have a compensated cognit cogn cognitive impairment. This there is a threshold where this is decompensated. This means that maybe I already have a cognitive impairment, but you don't recognize it now on me, but maybe if you do a very na a specific neuropsychological test, maybe I make a small mistake. I compensate. There is a threshold which if I reach, then you will notice at once that I have a cognitive. This threshold depends on where I was born, what I ate, my lifestyle, sport, uh, oil, olive oil, or nice weather in Santander, or genetics, or anything else, developmental aspects. So this threshold, somebody can reach if has only pure Alzheimer's disease pathology. But somebody can reach this threshold if he or she has five different diseases, but each only small. So this neurofibrillary tangle is not enough alone to cause cognitive decline. This TDP43 is not enough to cause. But if they are together, the patient reaches the threshold. So even with small amount of different pathologies, the patient will reach this threshold. This is the concept of concomitant pathologies. So the final slides, I just want to show you how this brain banking goes. Um, <clears throat> Uh, either you receive the brain as a, a native or fresh brain, this is how it looks like, so this is not fixed, this is uh, like this. You can freeze these slices or you can sample at once for histology. The same area, what you look in the microscope, you can put in the freezer for biochemical or DNA studies, even from the white matter or gray matter. You can prepare for frozen sections and also for electron microscopy. And here, this is a book on neuropathology of neurodegenerative diseases from Cambridge Press. We show how to evaluate these uh, diseases. This is, I want to show you that it is a very time-consuming and very complex work to examine these brains. So you need 
personnel for this, you need a lot of time for this. It's not that we start now a biobank and it's only one person there. You need support from uh, as much places as possible and to help the experts with uh, technicians and uh, administration and so on. This is what you can evaluate, this is what are open questions, but for all of these you need well-characterized human brain tissue and the people working with animal models, they also recognize that it's not enough anymore to say that what I see in mice, and then in the radio you hear that in mice the Alzheimer's disease was cured and everybody expects that next week you will get the tablets, but then it turns out that it is only in mice, so these, these researchers also need support from this uh, from this biobank and the, my final slide is that what we reached in the FTD is that you can already predict the pathology in a good level, even the genetic alteration. So if a patient comes with a progressive supranuclear palsy symptom to the movement disorder clinic, you can be pretty sure that the patient will have a tau protein problem at least 90% sure. This is already very important because there are already tau vaccination studies going on in, in humans. So they're giving injection with uh, like an influenza vaccine against the tau. So it will be very important to decide early whether this patient most likely has tau or sinuclein or TDP43. And now the only thing what we have in our hands is the imaging and some kind of uh, biomarker, but not yet well developed. But if the patient goes with a PSP, you can be pretty sure. And you can be also pretty sure what is the chance that this patient has a genetic disorder. If a patient comes with a frontotemporal dementia with amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, then you can be pretty sure that it is a TDP. And you can be pretty sure that the patient has 20, 20 to 30% chance to have a genetic background, even if he doesn't talk about the positive family history and so on. So this was my final slide, it's just a, a summary to show you that there are already these steps made, but I feel that there's a lot of things to, to open and what I see is that, uh, that the universities which are able to establish this uh, work between the clinical part, the pathology, the biobank, the biomarkers, the genetics, which will in the next 10 years will get the leading uh, position. So thank you for the, for the opportunity.